Hi, I'm Dan Schmidt. I do a weekly television show called Team Chicago Challenge. My website, teamchicago.tv. Teamchicago.tv. If you want to contact me, it's teamdan45 at gmail.com. We're at Mr. Beef's at Mount Prospect, Illinois. We're here for the Legends Get Together. Now, the Legends Get Together, Legends of Chicago and Motorcycle Racing, are guys that had great race experience racing Santa Fe Speedway all throughout the Midwest, some motocross people, mainly flat trackers, even some drag racers may show up. But I'm gonna to try to talk to different people that were involved in racing back in the good old days and even currently, because we still are racing motorcycles, we still are having a lot of fun. And if you wanna contact me, it's teamdan45 at gmail.com and let me know what you think of this clip up on YouTube. Mr. Beefs is on Route 83, or Elmhurst Road, just a little bit north of the backside of O'Hare Airport. If we would have been holding the Legends Get Together for all the years starting in 1990, this would be the 30th annual. Now let's go back to 1990 as I talked to my two friends, Terrell Otaki and Warren White. Me now are two, one former motorcycle dealer and one current motorcycle dealer. This is Warren White from Hanayama River Oaks, who you see at the end of my show is one of the sponsors of my show and one of the organizers of this. So what do you think, Warren? Was this a great turnout? It was a great turnout. It was a success. It was more than we could have hoped for. Everybody that was here today will be back next year, and they're going to tell a couple of people each. We'll have three times three times the people that we had and next year it'll be bigger and better. Okay, now, Torello used to have a Suzuki shop, Ducati shop, um, North, Moto Guzzi, North. Norton on North Avenue and before that on Halstead Street. Right. All these new upscale neighborhoods but you've been gone, you live in Florida. But Torello started the initial Team Chicago. That's right. <laughs> I didn't think you remembered. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I went out and talked to you and asked if I could use the name when I started racing sure, Santa right. Fe. Then you guys with the road racing disbanded, mm -hmm. and I took the name, and now I have a registered trademark on it. Oh, that's it. great. <laughs> that's great. But, okay, now, Warren was just telling me, now, for some of my audience, if you're ever going down Route 31, north of the tollway, maybe about four or five miles, and you wonder why is there a piece of highway that goes swinging around on your left if you're heading northbound. That's the old Meadowdale racetrack, which was in Carpentersville. That's correct. And Torello, you still hold the record? I hold the, uh, the, uh, the novice record, of course. And, uh, on a 250. On a 250 Ducati. And uh, uh, we did that. It was on a third try. The first try, we were not quite so fortunate. I think we stopped because of a broken fuel tank. The second year, uh, I think I, I had an engine problem. And the third year, uh, everything just clicked. And it just... And you won the national. Oh, boy, that I won the national. I think it couldn't have been a better, uh, a better party. I mean, it, uh, it's like all, all that I ever hoped for is win on a home track. You know? So how, how good was that track? Uh, the track at that time was really pretty good. I remember the, a lot of the um, a lot of the automobile drivers always complained about it, especially on the Monza Wall. Uh, it was pretty rough, but it just seemed that on a motorcycle, uh, it didn't seem to make a whole lot of difference. Uh, so I drove through there years ago, but it's one of them things that why do we keep losing tracks, or why don't we still have a track like that in the Chicago area? I think probably the the biggest reasons is that uh, no one has uh, ventured into the possibility of how to make money. In other words, no one's ever put the effort into uh, promotion. Well, I'll tell you. Uh, Let me tell you why. Yeah. It's the son of a uh, bees from ABC, NBC, and CBS oh, that ignore racing, that don't cover local sports, and they get their head in the air with football, baseball, basketball. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if we got fair, equal share of the TV time, I'm sure people would have as much interest. Oh, sure. Well, there again, too, uh, we don't, unfortunately, we in the motorcycle business don't have enough sponsorship. For example, as you well know, NASCAR is probably attended more than any other football game, baseball game, or whatnot. However, they have sponsors like 
Budweiser and so on, which of course helped promote the sports. Now uh, NASCAR is big time. It used to be NASCAR was, uh, hell, you had to be just above that of, a, of an animal, but now it's 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 really you know big thing. It's and, respectable now. Uh, it's very it's more than respectable. And uh, unfortunately, uh, no one has seen or no one has really put the effort into promoting you know. Really well, promoting it's still on. TV, and that's why I, yeah. and that's why I do really, my exactly. show, and that's why Bill does his show, and little by little, I think people will start oh, realizing that. It's, it's 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 unfortunate that uh, you know. We don't have uh, as much coverage as much coverage as we should have because, just as you said, NBC, ABC, and CBS all they care about is football, baseball, basketball, da 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 da. da. And while now NASCAR, since it came into its own, well, they don't ignore NASCAR. However, I will tell you that even where I moved down in Florida, and there's plenty of racing down in Florida. Hell, uh, Daytona Beach is only 90 miles away. We still get little or no coverage, even for NASCAR, but. Uh, it, it, it just the way it is. It's uh, they seem to think that this is where all the money is, so that's where we're going to give all the uh, all the all the press to, and well, uh, they're really missing the boat. Someday I'm going to have enough money to sue the three networks. So. <laughs> okay, next year, Warren, for sure, we're going to be back and do this again. Yeah, we're going to do it. We're going to do it bigger and better. Uh, we may have an outdoor event. We might uh, have a couple of motorcycle events to do it. There's a lot of these guys that have been laying back in the woodwork got away from motorcycling for whatever reason, maybe sold their motorcycle, maybe still do ride a motorcycle, but didn't know the other guys were still riding. And uh, this just opened up, uh, we're gonna see a chain reaction here, and it's gonna be great next year. And the, the people that showed up today had a good time, and they're wondering why wasn't so-and-so here, and they'll be here next year. Okay, great. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Thank you, Dan. Trello, nice seeing you again. And uh, hey, this is a guy road racing before I was road racing. <laughs> Thank you, Trello and Warren. As you look at this lovely triumph in front of that restaurant in Hillside, Jim Viverito is going to give the introduction to our Legends Gathering in 2005. I'm going to open this the way I did it last year. Everybody in the room knows what this is. Okay, so. This year's edition of the Legends of Chicagoland Motorcycle Racing is now called to order. Our annual bench racing and lying festival. And you all know what this is and you all know this ain't no ballet slipper. It's a skid shoe. A hot shoe for the left foot only. The steel point of the left leg outrigger that gives American flat track racing its unique three-point stance. Two wheels and a shoe, man and machine together as one. It doesn't matter if you had it made by a man named Ken or a fellow named George, or if it was fashioned in the garage out of the hacked off end of an old Buick's bumper. A flat tracker is as naked as a newborn without it. It's the essential tool of the trade. The catalyst that binds the rider, the bike, and the track to form the sport we call flat track. And with apologies to no one, you really can't call yourself a motorcycle racer unless you've worn one of these. Thank you, Jim. As we look at two photos of Jim Viverito racing at Santa Fe Speedway, I'm going to talk to Bob Puella, Chuck Ferret, and Ed Kubik. This is biker Bob Puella, formerly from Open Road Radio, and um, a good friend of Dan Schmidt for God knows how many years. But uh, Dan and I met originally when he had a coffee truck. It was called Dan's Coffee Cup, wasn't it, Dan? Right. And uh, I was a superintendent of construction on a job downtown, and we got to know each other because of uh, motorcycling. And uh, also, uh, at about that same time, I just started promoting motocross races at Turtle Park in um, 
Elkhorn, Wisconsin, back in the early 70s. All right, well, we'll get to that. Let's introduce Chuck. So, Chuck, tell me, how did you know Bob and how do you know me? Okay, uh, well, I know you, I believe, from when your son was racing BMX. I believe, or no, I... No, I before that, from the coffee truck. Oh, the coffee truck, yeah, but I, I can't remember that. Well, I remember when you used to go to Millburg, though, with your, your van. Right. Remember, we, you and I went to a race one time, even way up in uh, Ohio, I think it was. So we went and raced together. You were, yes, yeah, yes, right, yes, right, right. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, Did you want to do, what's your name? Tell me Chuck, your name. Chuck Farron is my name. Right, right. Yeah. And I've got a vast experience, like Bob, road riding. I did a 150 mile national road race in Carpentersville, Illinois. We used to be able to go out there for three bucks and practice or do whatever you wanted. It was really beautiful. You see, I remember that race too. In fact, it was Dick Mann who won one of the races out there and I believe he was on a BSA or a bachelor's or something but yeah. there was a guy by the name of Bob Hansen out of, oh, yeah. out of Wisconsin yeah. it was called Team Hansen and he ran matchless motorcycles and road racing and uh, the remnants of that track are still there if you if you ever go out there you can actually walk most of the track and if you're driving down going northbound on US or Illinois 31 you can see some of the track and you can once see, you get outside of Carpentersville, and you can see the uh, the tower. The old tower is still there, right, right, right. Oh yeah, it was a really a wonderful thing. I mean, you could go there. I remember one time I had one of my road bikes, and this guy was on a go kart, and he's clocking me, and he's like, "You're not so fast." So we go out there. I blew past that guy in the 180 degree turn. And he... So how many road races did you run back then? Uh, I, I mean, you were sponsored with Basil at uh, yeah, A Cycle Basil, World yeah. on the Ducati. I never paid for anything. I mean, he he was really good to me, you know. And uh, that's why I thought it was funny. Well, my arch rival here was Torello Taki. You remember Trello? Well, I'm sure. good he friends with Trello, yes. He was a Norton yeah. dealer, wasn't he? Uh, well, he was a Suzuki, Suzuki dealer, and, and he had Moto Guzzi. They had the right. shop on Halstead by and Division. Then they, moved, then they moved to Grand Avenue. North Avenue. Or, or, well, Where it comes together. Right. right. West of Pulaski. Right, right. And he's retired, and he's still kicking in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. I guess, I guess he flies a plane, and he... Has seminars on rebuilding the plane engine. I don't know that I would trust him. Well, you know, I, I have a funny Torello Taki true story. I went into a shop one time, and if you remember, the Nortons were not unit construction. The the transmissions and the engines were separate. Mm -hmm. And at that time, Triumph for unit construction. And I says, how come Norton isn't unit construction? And he laughed at me. And he said, like, you don't know what you're talking about. All fast motorcycles have separate transmissions and engines. Tell me a little bit about putting on the motocross race in Elkhorn, 1971, because I did go to that race. Well, here's how this came about. Uh, Les Klinko was approached by Jack Morgan, who was at that time uh, uh, promoting the race under the, what was called the Motocross Racing Circus. But he needed some additional investments. So what we did, which was myself, it was... Um, uh, well, you mentioned Michael. Edison Dye, or...? Well, Edison Dye was before us, okay? Edison Dye brought motocross over this country. Right. Brought all the Swedes over, you know? Uh, Torsten Hallman and Charlie Hansen, some of these other guys. Aki Johnson. Aki Johnson. But then what happened was, the, the uh, AMA started what they call the Interam. And, and uh, Edison Dye still promoted, but he didn't do all of them anymore. So we wound up promoting the race in 1971, and we were, you 
might say artistic success, but we lost money on it because I think too many people snuck in. Okay, we and, had, well, and it did rain that day. It was a rainy it day. day. They did pull off the race, it, and it was jam packed. I mean, there was a, it was standing room only, but I think half the people snuck in, Dan, and that was one of the reasons. So then we did it one more time in '72, and then after that, the track was sold to uh, a developer who put a golf course up there. So that was the end of So where was that track located in relationship to downtown Elkhorn? Okay, if you were to go directly north uh, on Route 12 and um, cross, I think it was called Crossroads or something, Route 12 and Crossroads, which is at the north end of Elkhorn, it was right there on the uh, south southeast corner, southeast corner of that intersection. And it was a beautiful track, one of the best tracks we ever had. Unfortunately, golf won out and uh, it, it's no more. And that was the end of our promotion. Right. Well, did you just road, how much flat track racing well, did you I did do a lot back of then? Flat track racing too, but did I, you race at Santa Fe? Oh yeah, I raced at Santa Fe a lot. The first day that I went out there when Howard Tate was on a Sunday, I rode a Ducati out there. I had a Triumph muffler on the pipe backwards. It fit perfectly. I took it off and went out there with Art Varda and all the rest of them. And I mean, it was it was just the greatest time I ever had. Also, I want to say this. Jeff Mickey Mouse Sperry he had these, and Jim Lineweber and myself were the first three riders to ride the TT track at Santa Fe when they just built it. They so what year would that been that they built? You're saying like 69, 68? Uh, probably. Right. But we were the first three riders to ride on that TT track. And uh, that's that's a fun memory. That was that was one of my favorite tracks. I, I loved it. Well, right. Santa Fe was the heart of flat track racing in the United States in the middle 50s because every national rider would go there on a Wednesday night because they'd be someplace else on the weekends, but they'd be within driving distance of Chicago. As far as I know, there were only two tracks in the country that ran a full season, Santa Fe and Ascot Speedway in Gardena. And Ascot ran Friday nights in Gar Gardenia, California, and Santa Fe ran every Wednesday night. Right, right. Let's end this up by talking about open road radio. So tell me about your adventures. Well, um, one day I was at Illinois Harley Davidson and I ran into this lovely young lady by the name of Gina Woods and we got to become friends. And so um, a few months later she said, Bob, would you be interested in coming on a new radio show? called Open Road Radio, and I said, I, I don't know, you know, what do I know about radio? So we wound up in this little radio station in um, Highland, Park. Highland Park, in the basement. And it was Gina, and I, and my wife, and uh, Chris Tiger Lady, and, and Dan Schmidt, and uh, who was the... Viverito, wasn't he? Well, Viverito wasn't there yet. Who was that other crazy guy uh, with the orange motorcycle? <laughs> Sano. Santo. Okay. All right, let me say something. Do you know that it was Sano that put Gina and... Tiger Lady together. No, I did not yes. know that. He is responsible ultimately for Open Road Radio. And Open Road Radio is still on Saturday mornings. On, There'll be a CGO. Uh, CGO, right. 1590 on your AM dial. Right, and right. I did not listen to it today. Right. I was hoping she'd come, come here. Today. I know, I was hoping too. Well, thanks. We had a lot of fun. We, uh, we actually we went all over the country with Open Road Radio. We went to the Love Ride in California. We went to New Orleans, which was the, I believe, the 30th anniversary of Easy Rider. So we had a lot of good times with Open Road Radio. Unfortunately, I think we contributed to the downfall of the uh, 
the Hollister or um, Gilroy version of Indian because after that, shortly after that, they went belly up. So. <laughs> All right, Chuck, one more thing. Yes. BMX, your son, my son, racing in the early days, right. the old the early days of NBL. Right, and ABA. ABA and... Right. Uh, I think those were the two major sanctioning bodies. Right, right. Yeah, my son and uh, his son were pretty good BMX my son racers. Yeah. Raced a little bit too, but not as much as you, your guys' sons. But now, when you see it on TV, they actually go on courses now on BMX bikes. I mean, it's really it's almost like motocross. It's become an Olympic yeah. sport. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Any last word? Congratulations on all the years that you've been on your TV show. Dan, how many years is it now? 32. Good for you. I love it, Dan. I watch you every chance I have. I love your show. You're really an inspiration to old guys and young alike. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ed Kubik. I raced at Santa Fe from 68 to 72. Uh, my claim to fame, if you want to call it that, I was just a novice racer, uh, was that I was a two-digit nov uh, novice, 44S, and I was the last person to qualify a long-stroke sprint in the main program. And Dave Sell and Neil Keene were in the same heat race with me. Uh, I had a wonderful five times there, even though I got clobbered a couple times in a bad accident, but uh, it was the best times of my life, and uh, there's no money will place it and I'd probably make a deal with the devil to go back and do it again one night. Well, tell me more about the racing at Santa Fe. How did, how did the program run? How, how serious and how tough was it to make the program? Oh, the, the, seri the seriousness of the program was that 70 guys would show up for 32 spots. And it was for money, not trophies. And it was like, don't take my weekly paycheck away from me. And you could be sure that uh, out of the 70 guys, there'd be at least 12 national numbers, you know, super experts. So it was cutthroat, but uh, actually at the end of the race, if uh, you were one of the guys that went to the Blue Front, which was a local, uh, kind of, I hate to say, you know, a hillbilly bar, uh, everybody was friends and you all had a good time. And God, they sure, they sure spent a lot of their racing money. It was, it was good times those days. Okay, so you're saying they would qualify, everybody had to qualify, so yeah. you took a flying lap to qualify. Yep. And then the fastest 32, 32 would make up four heat races of eight, is that what that's it was? That's right, that's correct, yeah, four heat races. Of and eight. they had a staggered start, so tell me about that staggered start. Oh, uh, the, the one time I qualified, I, I pulled up to the line and uh, Duca, who was the starter, was a real stickler for doing things right, and he yelled at me because I was in the first spot, I had gone to the riders meeting, so I moved to the second spot and he starts yelling at me again and then he says you didn't go to the writers meeting and I, I sheepishly said no and I found out I was the third one back that I had qualified well for a novice you know in the main program so let's point this out so the fastest guy would be in the first heat race and start eight eight eight, eight bike lanes back yeah, in the eight, corner eight bike lanes and the back, slowest yeah. qualifier one would, would start up in the front, in the front so correct. if you went to see the race like i remember one night that yeah. that uh, uh jim rice was there on his bsa 250 mm -hmm. he started all the way in the back and within two laps he was in front so he just rode around because he was really that fast yeah uh, i thought the staggered start was unfair to the slow guys because I thought the fast guy should be in the front and the slow guy should be in the back only because the slow guy had more straightaway to pick up speed. And it was uh, because most of the time, if you were the slow guy in the heat, that fast guy passed you right into the first turn. You know, but uh, it was, but, it was but good. You, you, if you made the program, you weren't a slow guy. No, no, you weren't, no, you weren't, no, you weren't slow. And then the rest of the guys, I remember the next 60, because there'd be a yeah. hundred riders. Oh, yeah, yeah. There could be that the next idea. 60 would make the B program. Yeah. And the B program, they would run six heats of 10. Yes. And then they would take the first two out of those heats and have a 12 man B final. That's right. And if you won the B final, you won $40. 
that much? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, this I, is when it was a twelve hundred dollar yeah program. I, I remember. I remember uh, in the Santa Fe days, uh, I was talking uh, to Neil Keen and Daryl Doble. And basically, if you won your heat race, you won your semi, you won your final, and the trophy and dash, the trophy dash, you know, a top guy, a top, you know, a top racer would make 320, 340 bucks for the evening, you know, that, you know, at Santa Fe or County Fair. But Neil Keen and Daryl Doval at 320 dollars a race, these guys made 10 thousand dollars a summer. So you can imagine how much racing and how many county fairs they went to. You know, they, these those two guys in particular were, and Don Tibbin also. They were they were real right. They were riders, riders. They knew how to go out there and scratch out a living uh, racing. Right. It was it was the best years of my life. All right. So you were a novice for two years. Five years, all five years. Oh, you never made junior. No, no, no. no. Uh, some of the other novices. Now did you only race Santa Fe. Uh, I raced half miles when I could get to them. But what upset the uh, novices uh, was like the fourth and fifth year that I raced, 71 and 72, one novice came up to me and said, what's the deal with your number plate? Because I was 44S. And he told me that the new rule was all novices had to be three digits. And from what I understood, there were only three novices in the United States that were double digits, 11, 33, and my 44. And they were all mad because I had a nice number. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it was... Uh, so what bikes did you race during that time? Uh, actually, I raced three different bikes. I, I raced uh, my Harley Sprint. A friend of mine had a Boltaco Persang. Uh, that was, uh, I rode Mike Anders' X Boltaco Persang. And then Dennis Smeal, which raced out of... Uh, a BSA shop in Maywood uh, with Dick Varner, he lent me his BSA 250. So I had experience on a 250, a Boltaco, and then my Harley Sprint. Thank you, Bob, Chuck, and Ed. As we see this poster of Carol Westweber, three-time national champ and a champ out at Santa Fe, special thanks to Mr. Beefs. They're on Elmhurst Road, Mount Prospect. Give them a call at 847-228-1210. They provided great hospitality and great food. To contact me, it's teamdan45 at gmail.com. Let me know what you think of this clip. And remember, you can always search on YouTube with Dan Schmidt Motorcycle Racing.